Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. I won't forget the moment I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life And where there was dead religion Now there is living faith Found in Jesus' name, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free. The Take all eternity, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. Oh, you brought me back to life. Oh, you brought me back to life. Oh,
All right. Good morning, church family. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord today. Praise God for the rain this morning. Uh, what a day it is to be here. I know that uh, there's many of us who might be uh, not here this morning or many who I know are ailing or are sick or uh, you fill in the blank there. But the Lord has provided us this space this morning to bring his name glory and to praise him in song, the study of his word, and through prayer. I invite you, uh, if you are visiting with us today, I want to encourage you to take some time today to fill out one of the Connect cards that can be found in your weekly worship guide. Uh, or uh, uh, outside in the hallway, you can grab one of those. You can pick one of those up at the doorway. Uh, and the Connect cards can also be found on the back of the pew in front of you. We want you to uh, connect with us better. And we want to serve you as best as we possibly can. I invite you to stand where you are with me as uh, I open this up in a word of prayer today. And we go before the Lord and prepare our hearts for song. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful that you have provided this space for us today to glorify your name. And we pray before a word comes out of our mouth this morning of praise. That, Lord, you would show how great you are to us. You would show us that you are a merciful God, that you are a loving God, a just God. And we're asking today that you would show us more of who you are. But Lord, if there's anything today that would keep us from glorifying your name, that would keep us from bringing you praise, Lord, we ask that today we would lay that down at your feet. Would you help us identify sin, oh God? Search our hearts. See if there be any grievous way in us. Lord, we pray that today as we lift your name on high, you would be honored by our song. Be glorified in this place. Let your spirit have its way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. Let's sing, come all you weary, come all you thirsty. Son to say for 
16 at this time. Let's continue to celebrate that. Turn and greet somebody around you real fast. Meet a new face this morning here at Exchange. morning church. Um, as we start our, uh, our missions moment this morning, I want to, to share some scripture from Acts chapter 4, which says this, and when they had prayed, they, the place in which they had gathered was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. And the reason I wanted to share that is because we're going to spend some time in prayer, and, but I, I really want to spend this time, uh, a couple times a month or so, highlighting other ministries in the sense of other churches. Often we pray for our church, often we pray for God to do a mighty work here, but do you know the Lord is moving in other churches and in other buildings and in other places around our city? And so as we as a church here at Exchange Avenue have been blessed for 106 years to do gospel ministry here, um, that's on the backs of many other churches who have been so gracious with us. And so we're going to be starting this new tradition where we just start praying for some specific churches, um, and these today are ones we've partnered with. So right now we're partnering uh, with Wilmont Place, uh, Redemption Church, Olivet Baptist Church, and Youth for Christ. We're partnering with them for our See You at the Pole rally, which is going to be this coming uh, Wednesday night. Um, and God is doing tremendous things. I can't wait to share in the coming days more and more. Preston can't wait to share in the coming days. He had 54 kids at a lunch, uh, middle school luncheon, where he was able to speak about Jesus. 54. Hallelujah. The Lord is moving. The Lord is opening up doors. The Lord is doing remarkable things. And so, would, would you join me as I pray for these churches? This is to help us be kingdom-minded, have the perspective of, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, here at Exchange and also around our city. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've made. We thank you, Lord, for all the churches in our city, Lord, that are meeting right now, we specifically want to lift up Wilmont Place Baptist Church, their pastor, Tanner Blosser, and the, the reality that they're celebrating their 100th anniversary today. What a gift. God, we ask that you would give them not only another 100 years of ministry, but it would be fruitful ministry, that they would make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We thank you for Tanner, his leadership, his love for that church, Give them vision for what they need to do in the coming days. Oh, God, you are so good. And Lord, I thank you for Redemption Church. Thank you for John Mark Hart, his leadership, the heart that he has to have a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church that reaches the city in a very unique way. God, I thank you for him and for them. They make our community better. Would you continue to have your hand and your work um, in his life and in the church's life? as they seek to prosper and move and spread your gospel just south of us. You're so good, God. And Lord, I thank you for all of it, Baptist Church. I thank you for their interim pastor, Jim Gert. Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing would be upon them and your hand of blessing would be upon their pastoral search committee as they seek to find who the next pastor um, needs to be in the coming days. And, and Lord, I, I thank you for his leadership, Jim's. I thank you for the church's emphasis in trying to reach their, their community, their Jerusalem, just right around them. Lord, would you have your way in the hearts of the people who live right around them that they may uh, 
be a bold witness and a faithful witness and find some open hearts of the people, Lord, um, that they seek to serve. And God, I thank you for Youth for Christ. I thank you for John Howery. I thank you, Lord, for all the ways uh, that he is being used by you for campus ministry. Lord, from Capitol Hill High School to Santa Fe Southwest Middle School, God, you have uh, Youth for Christ uh, groups and camps and clubs all around the city. And we ask right now, God, that your spirit would be upon those leaders and your spirit would move upon those students and that your gospel would be shared and people and students would come to know you as their Lord and Savior and our schools would be transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for all the work that you are doing in this city. We give you praise and glory for the work that we see you doing here and elsewhere around our city. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
and his righteousness. Let's sing this this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, on other ground is sinking sand, on other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand all of the ground First, the kingdom and its treasures. Seek 
first the king hangs trash everything else it will be I is all that I'm needing we know it I know the Lord will provide cause I know my God's not empty and he gives us blessings upon bless I'm still believing First the kingdom. So see first the kingdom and its treasure and everything else it will be out is all that I'm needing. I know the Lord will provide. Cause I know my God's not empty hand and he gives us blessing. Sings upon bless. I'm still believing. I know the Lord will provide. Sing everything. Is everything I need? Everything I need. My Father has it. My Father has it. And every single time, the Lord will provide. Every single time, the Lord will provide. I know my Father has, my Father has it. Lord, we know that you give us everything that we need. You supply all things that are needed. And Lord, may we be found as people who seek first your kingdom and the treasures above. And Lord, today, would you show us something new about your word? Would you draw us to yourself through your loving kindness? Oh God, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to remain standing just for a moment. Uh, this time we'll dismiss our children who are four years old through third grade to a time of children's church with Miss Kathy in the back. Uh, and if you would, remain standing for a moment in the honor of reading God's word as Pauline brings our scripture today from John. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am, in, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. John 9, 1 through 7. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see me may see and those who see me may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. John 9, 35 through 41. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and I pray today it would convict Pierce between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. And God, we thank you for giving us the hope and the reality of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has saved sinners such as I, redeemed us for a life called by your name to do your good works here on earth. And so, Lord, as we examine your scriptures today, may you move boldly, hide me behind your cross. And Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, may today be the day of salvation. May they come to know you this day 
as their Savior. As a God who loves them, cares for them, and has a plan and purpose for their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are in the Apprentice series. This is the third, uh, the third installment of our series this, mor- uh, this day. And so we have examined the past two weeks. We examined what it looks like to love God and what that means. So an apprentice of Jesus is one who follows Jesus. And it's one who's been changed by Jesus forever, by his words, by his spirit, by his purpose. And so the question through this series is what does it look like to live as an apprentice of Jesus in a sinful world? And so one who's an apprentice of Jesus, a follower of his, that person must love God. And so we examine first what it looks like to love God. And how do you love God? Jesus said that we as um, his people are to seek to love him with our whole heart, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. That is the great command. And so we examine what it looks like to love God, and then last week we examined what it looks like to love our neighbor. And so then this week, it's now building, so we, as we love God and as we love our neighbor, now we get to do this for the glory of God. And so when I say the glory of God, the question that now should come to hand for all of us is, what does it mean to glorify God? How do you bring glory to God? And what is it like? Let's put that in very practical terms. And so the best way I can illustrate this is if we all try to define beauty by speaking about it, what do we all know the term? Beauty is in what? The eye of the beholder, which is great for a lot of us in the room. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So that means beauty for you is different than beauty for me. But you know what we can do? We can point to something that is beautiful. And we can say, this sunset is beautiful. This mountain is beautiful. The same thing is true with glory. We can be in awe of something and see the glory of nature, the majestic beauty of God through an example. It is hard to put it in words. So today we're going to try, I am going to attempt to put it in words for us. So that's an impossible task. But I hope and pray that by the end of this today, you will see actually how easy it is to glorify the Lord with your life. Because God has called us to do this, which means our God is a God of clarity and understanding. He's not a God of confusion and distortion. That's the prince of this world. And so he wants us to have clarity on what it means to live for his glory and how we can be people who glorify him. And so I had Pauline read this section of scripture from John chapter 9 because in this section of scripture we have a beggar who is blind and he is asked by his disciples, Jesus is asked by his disciples, who sinned, this man or his parents, for this man to be born blind? blind. Who sinned? A common understanding that God punishes people for their sin and it's manifest in their life today. And Jesus said no, and that is a misunderstanding of scripture by the way, but Jesus said no, this man, it's, he is not blind because of a sin that he's done in the womb or a sin that his parents did in their life to cause him to be born blind. Jesus says he was born blind for a specific purpose, for the power of God to be put on display. The power of God to be put on display. And then what did Jesus do? Jesus spat on the ground, which is weird. Jesus made mud with that spit, which is weird. And he put it on his eyes, which is also weird. Let's just think about that. What what am I teaching my boy to do? Don't spit, especially in daddy's house. 
Here's our Lord spitting on the ground. I try not to read this story to my boys. Did he have to spit? No. Did he have to make mud? No. Did he have to do these things? No. What did he prove? He proved that he has the ability to give sight. He, is, he proved that he has the ability to heal. But can I tell you, that's just the surface level. The implications of that healing are far-reaching. And so here's why we have this. What happens when God's power is put on display? What happens? He's glorified. He's glorified. So when God's power is put on display in your life, what happens? God is glorified. Did this blind man do anything to receive sight? Other than being there. He did nothing. No works. He didn't take a shower. He didn't do anything. And what happened? He was healed. The power of God was placed in this man's life, and this man received sight. Beautiful. This morning, we're going to examine three aspects of living for God's glory. Three aspects of living for God's glory. And so the first aspect, as an apprentice... An apprentice of Jesus has experienced God's power. Have you experienced God's transforming power? You can't be an apprentice if you don't know Jesus. You can't be an apprentice of Jesus if you haven't experienced him. Has he taken you from death to life? Do you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you? Have you repented of your sin and trusted him as your Savior? To be an apprentice of Jesus, you need to know Jesus. To be an apprentice of Jesus, you need to follow Jesus. To be an apprentice of Jesus, you need to ex have experienced his power. This man experienced the power of God by receiving sight. He was blind from the womb, which means he, he has never seen a thing. And all of a sudden, this miracle happens. He goes to this pool, and what happens? He opens up his eyes, and he can see clearly. His eyesight was transformed. But if we dive a little deeper into this, it's not just about this man's eyes that were transformed, but notice what Jesus did. Jesus went to someone who's broken. Jesus went to someone who's needy. Jesus went to someone who was desperate. Jesus went to someone who could not do something for themselves. Jesus went and what did Jesus do? He met a great need. Jesus did something for this man that no matter how much money he had, he could not give himself. No matter who he knew on earth, he could not give himself sight. Well, the same is true for us. Guess what? We are dead apart from Jesus Christ. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. You cannot cleanse your life apart from Jesus. You, there's no work you can do, money you can give, person you can know but from Christ to have forgiveness of your sin. There's nothing you can do. So the question at hand is, do you know Jesus, not just know him, but have you trusted in him as Lord and Savior of your life? Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Or as the middle school kids have heard at camp this summer, have you made Jesus the boss of your life? So that when Jesus says, hey, do this, you say, yes, sir. Not, well, I, are, are you sure, Jesus? Do you know what I'm going through? He does. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? This means that the transforming power of the gospel must be at work within you. This means that at some point you have heard that Jesus loves you so much that he went to a cross and died for you. This means that Jesus, who went to the cross and died for you, didn't just stay there dead. 
but he rose from the dead three days later to show his power over Satan, to show his power over sin, and to show his power over death. He has defeated all three. Do you believe in G- that Jesus is God? Do you believe he died for your sins? Do you believe that he's city- seated in heaven right now and he's going to return? Do you believe that he's God? If you believe those things and you place your faith and trust in him, you are saved. The Bible says it very cleanly and specifically. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Christ Jesus is Lord and was raised from the dead, you will be what? Saved. So this morning, as an apprentice of Jesus, are you saved? Have you experienced the power of God? Because if you're not saved, then we can't move forward. If Jesus knows you by name, but you don't know him by name, we're not going to be able to go to the next step. The Bible says that the followers or apprentices of Jesus know his voice and do what? Follow him. So this morning, are you following Jesus? An apprentice of Jesus has experienced God's power. An apprentice of Jesus is created for God's glory. Is created for God's glory. Sometime, you turn to Isaiah 43, not right now. Turn to Isaiah 43 and read the first seven verses. They're beautiful. In those first seven verses, uh, God is talking to his people, Israel, and what he is saying is, you are my people, I love you. You are my people, here's what I'm doing for you. I have pulled you out of Egypt. I took you across the sea on dry ground. I separated rivers for you. I've provided for you. I've driven out other peoples in the land that I gave you because I want to prepare a place for you. I love you you. And the the chief verse in Isaiah 43 is verse 7. You can listen as I read it. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. If you've read any part of the Bible, you know that Genesis begins, in the beginning God made. In the beginning God made. In the beginning God made. How did this world begin? Not with a bang, but with God. And God made everything. He made it all, and he made it all for his glory. And guess what? On day six, he made you and he made me. Represented by Adam and Eve. He made humanity, and he made us in his image, and he gave us the dominion of the world, and he gave us a command to make babies and conquer the world, but to live for his glory. And you know what happened? If you read Genesis, we didn't do it. We didn't live for him. We didn't live for his glory. We lived for us and ourselves. We wanted to make a name for us instead of making a name for him. And so because of that, our hearts went away from God instead of to God. So the question at hand is, is your heart as an apprentice of Jesus following after him? Or is your heart as an apprentice of Jesus still selfish? Are you seeking your own desires above his? Are you seeking to make a name for yourself above his? Are you seeking your kingdom come before his kingdom come? This looks really easy, and I'm not stepping on everybody's toes, but it might be. Do you tithe to the church, or do you give to retirement? Because if you only give to one, which, where are you investing your finances? If you're investing your finances in your eternal kingdom and obeying God and investing in your tithe alone, I would suggest you make some changes and try to give to both. 
But if you're only giving to your retirement and you're not investing in obeying the word of the Lord, maybe your eyes are focused on your kingdom come instead of his kingdom come because you're not even obeying his word as the boss of your life. Hey, you need to tithe. And you say, but you don't know my finances. You don't know my bills. And he says, yes, I do. He says, not only do I know your finances, not only do I know your bills, I know you better than you know yourself because Psalm 139 says, before there was one of your days, he planned all of your ways. He knows you're coming. He knows you're going. He knows your thoughts before you think them. He knows the words before you speak them. He knows you intimately well. Intimately well. It's not that you have to find a word to describe yourself to God. He already knows the words and gives you the words to describe yourself to Him. You were made in His image and His likeness, and this is your purpose, to glorify Him. But guess what? You can't glorify Him if you don't know Him. What did the text say in, verse 40, in chapter 43 of Isaiah, verse 7? Everyone who's called by my name. Are you called by his name? That goes back to the first aspect of the sermon. If you're not a Christian, you're not called by his name. Are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? So are you called by my name? Whom I created for my glory. Whom I formed and made. So our ultimate, one of our ultimate purposes is as a worshiper of Jesus is to do it for his glory. But here's, what I, here's where I want to connect the thing. I'm trying to connect this to the blind man. Okay? What did the blind man do to regain sight? Nothing. Jesus put some mud on his eyes. Jesus told him to go to a pool called Scent. Go to that Scent pool and wash. So he goes to the scent pool, he washes, he sees. What does he do? He then goes to the temple, and everybody's looking at him like, wait, we know you. Aren't you the blind guy? Aren't you that beggar? And he's like, I once was, but I've been transformed, baby. And what did they say? No, it can't be you. That can't be you. You see, you are blind. He's like, it's me. Surprise! To the point that now the people in the temple do what? They're so mad at him because he's like, I'm blind, but now I see, and that Jesus did it. He's God. He's now testifying. He gets to the point that the people get so mad that he's testifying about Jesus, he's kicked out of the temple. This might make not a lot of sense for us here at Exchange Avenue Baptist Church because there's a lot of Baptist, Baptist church in Oklahoma City specifically. But to be kicked out of the temple for a Jew was to be pushed out or kicked away or excommunicated from the presence of God because where was the presence of God? In the temple, in the Holy of Holies. So by being pushed away from the temple, it meant you couldn't get your sins forgiven. And if you can't give your sins forgiven, what are you living in? In sin and under the wrath and penalty of your sin very similar with the Catholic Church. If you've ever had any connection with the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church believes they are the dispensers of grace. That means forgiveness. They are the only ones who can give forgiveness. It's not true. It's a heresy, but I'll dive. I'm not going to dive into that. The whole point being, he's now kicked out of the temple. In a worldly perspective, he's kicked out from the presence of God, and who finds him? Who finds him? It's not him. He, he doesn't go and find Jesus. He doesn't go and say, okay, there's a guy who healed me. I don't know what he looks like, but man, I know him. he made me. He gave me sight. I just got to go find him. Who found him? Jesus. Jesus found the man he healed, and Jesus found him after he'd been kicked out of the temple. This is why Pauline read that second portion. It's the final part, and I'll just remind us of all of it today remind us all of it. It's verse 35 
of chapter 9 of John. Jesus heard that they cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? So this shows this man's understanding. He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? So, he, this man's been healed. He knows a miracle's been done, but he doesn't know who Jesus is. So Jesus now comes to him and says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Basically saying, modern day vernacular, Hey, do you believe in Jesus? He's, Jesus answers, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. So if that doesn't say, hey, I'm God, and I healed you, if that does not communicate to you that, it communicated that to the beggar, or to the blind man, because of how he responded. Look how he responded. He said, Lord, so that's God, I believe. And what did he do in this moment? And he worshipped him. For a Jew, this would be what if Jesus was not God? Idolatry. For Jesus as a Jew, if he was not God... What would this be of himself? To receive worship from another, not being God, would be idolatry because he would be worshiping himself. Jesus knows he's God. This man that's been healed of his blindness now knows that Jesus is God by this blind man worshiping Jesus as God. What is God receiving? Glory. Glory. God is receiving glory. Why? Because God has now done something in this man's life that apart from his work, he could never do himself. Apart from Jesus, apart from the miracle, apart from Jesus finding him after he'd been kicked out of the temple, apart from Jesus' work going and doing, apart from Jesus, this man not only he would he be blind, but he wouldn't be a worshiper of God. He wouldn't be saved. And Jesus said, For judgment I have came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. It's very important to see. Some of the Pharisees heard him And said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. What did Jesus just say? Jesus is not talking about their physical sight. Jesus has used this blind man as an illustration. Did this blind man need to know that he was born blind? No. The Pharisee says, are we blind? What does that question tell us? He doesn't know he's a sinner. If he doesn't know he's a sinner, what doesn't he need? A savior. Okay, in other words, he doesn't know he's blind, so he's not going to seek a physician or a healer. This man thinks he's good. This man thinks he's got it. This Pharisee so he asked, well, are, are, are we blind? Not, I'm blind and I need you too. He asks, if you're blind, you don't need to ask. You know you're blind. But he's deceived because he thinks he's earned his way to God. And the deception is that he sees. So he asks as a seeing one, am I blind? which is not the right question. And Jesus says, because you think you can see, you are still under your guilt. Meaning, instead of asking, am I blind? It's, I need you, Jesus. But he's blind to his need because he thinks he's saved by his works or by the family that he was born into or by the church that he attends. A work. 
Which is why we started this sermon with this. Have you experienced God's power? An apprentice of Jesus has to experience God's power. An, an, ex, an, an apprentice of Jesus has to be one who, ha, who knows God intimately well as a healer, redeemer, savior. Has responded to God's love for them by seeking to love him. Have you experienced God's power? Second, an apprentice of Jesus is created for God's glory. First, First Peter 2, 9 through 10 says this: You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, salvation, transformation. Once you were not a people. You are nobody from nowhere sinning. But now you are whose people? God's people. Once you had not received mercy under the wrath of your sin. Now you have received mercy by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. An apprentice of Jesus is created for God's glory. Thirdly and finally, an apprentice of Jesus displays God's glory for all to see. You might say, well, pastor, this feels very lofty. You're saying a lot of good things, but how do I practice this in my daily life? How do I go about living as an apprentice of Jesus who glorifies God daily? What does that look like? Well, I just want to turn your attention to the first two sermons that we preached. Or I preached and you heard. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. So the entire essence of you, with all of you, with all of who you are, you are to love God. And if you as a former blind person spiritually dead person unable to love God can now by the blood of Jesus Christ love God with all of yourself what are you doing glorifying God if you as a former dead person spiritually who could not receive and then dispense give out the love of God to the people around you it, not only if you love God but you love your neighbor as yourself so you love you, not defined by the world, but you love you as God loves you. So you're free of the shame or the guilt of your past because that no longer exists. You're not under condemnation, Romans 9. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for those who are saved by him. If you're saved, there's no condemnation. If, there, if you're saved, there's no shame. If you're saved... There's no guilt. Do you love yourself as a saved one? As a guiltless one? As a shameless one? Even the sin that you've committed or the sin that's been done against you, are you free and free indeed because of the blood of Jesus? Because not only are you free to love God with all of your essence, all of who you are, but now you're free to love your neighbor as yourself. To sacrifice for your neighbor for the purpose of what? For them to see the God in whom you serve. But not just to see the God. Take that away for God to be glorified with your life. Because as you love God, you're giving God glory. As you love your neighbor, you're giving God glory. First Peter chapter three verses eight through twelve. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, 
and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or rivaling for rivaling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Whoever desires a life desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and he hears, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord's face is against those who do evil. Ephesians tells us that we are made to do good works. We're saved to do good works, and our good works glorify God. We are not saved by our good works. We are saved to do good works. We show our faith by our deeds. As we are after salvation, we display for a watching world our salvation by how we act, how we behave, how we talk, how we walk, where we go. So the simple question that we have for us in application this morning, Christian. Examine your life. If an investigator were to look at your life from when you wake up until when you go to bed over a week period of time, would that investigator say, I knew nothing about this person, and now I've seen their life for one week, and they are a Christian? They are a lover of God. They are a man or woman of prayer. They are a man or woman of this book that they just keep reading because they're on a reading plan and they have to read chapters a day. They just can't put it down. That was a gentle reminder. We're on a reading plan. If you don't have yours, it's in the hallway underneath the table, underneath the TV. If you're behind, it's okay. Let's just be men and women of the book. But what would that investigator say about your life? Or would they say, man, that guy wakes up every day, he goes to work, he works hard, but his mind is just set on this thing called football. He thinks about his fantasy football. He thinks about what football is going to be on TV. He thinks about what, fo- what changes need to be made to his team, though he is not a coach, but he thinks about it. And that's what he talks about. He talks to his neighbor about it. He talks to his coworkers about it. He talks to every, everybody about it. He just talks about it. He must just really like football. Or whatever else it is. You might be a car guy or car girl, you might be all about shopping, you might be all about your kids, or your grandkids. Have you deified your children or your grandchildren? So you worship them or seek to live through them. What would they say? Or would they come back and just say, man, they glorify God. Take a look in the mirror this week. What would an investigator say about your life? Second, worship is not only something that we do in this room. Living a life of worship is something that gives glory to the Lord, and it's a response to his word. When we apply God's word to our life, now we're living a life of worship, which does what? Glorifies God. Do you give your day, each day, to the Lord? When you wake up in the morning, I don't know what time that is. But do you wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, this is the day that you have made. I am going to rejoice. So maybe for some of you, this is just step one. I am going to rejoice and be glad because you haven't smiled in a while. So I'm going to rejoice. And it might be hard, but those muscles. I'm going to rejoice and be glad because of what he's done for me. Not because my situation or circumstance has changed, but because God is in my life. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be glad. 
His mercies are new for me this morning. Hallelujah. I'm going to go out praising him. I'm going to give him my day. I'm going to give him my driving. I'm going to give him my work. I'm going to give him my tongue. I'm going to give him my ears, what I listen to. I'm going to give him my eyes, what I see. I'm going to seek to glorify him in every way. So I'll do that for his good and his glory. That his presence and his spirit may work through us to give us divine appointments. To connect with people who need to hear and have and receive the hope of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 17 says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at a fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are suffering, you are sharing in Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So how are we to glorify the Lord as peacemakers who seek to go out making peace, seeking to live a life of worship that glorifies God? And that if we are slandered or ridiculed or if we are persecuted for the name of Christ, we should glory in that. Now that is a process. That's a journey that I'm on. I have not arrived where Peter is. I don't suspect you have either. But to find that type of persecution and when it hits me, I think, hallelujah, I'm so glad. I'm going to rejoice and have joy in this suffering. I'm not there yet, but God is leading me. And I pray that God would lead you in that manner as well and help you in that journey of sanctification to bring you into the mind of Christ that when you suffer for his name's sake, you are suffering with Christ and for Christ and there's glory in that. But how do we not live? Did you catch it in the text? First Peter chapter 4. We should not suffer as a murderer or as an evildoer or as a meddler or as... Just name it. Why? Because we're not living in our former self anymore. We're living as new creations. The old is gone. The new has come. We live out our life and our faith as Christians. So the best way to glorify God on earth is to do good works. Because apart from Jesus Christ on the cross, could you do those good works you're doing? So by doing those good works, who's receiving the glory? God. When you are prompted to pray, it's the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. When you're prompted to do a good work, it's the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. Every good work you do is because of God in your life. See it that way. It's not about you. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. If you're here today and you're blind, not physically blind, but spiritually blind because you've never tasted and seen the goodness of God. We're going to have a song of response. And as the Preston Morris trio makes their way up, the song of response is a time for you to take a step forward. For you to make a commitment to Jesus. That you don't leave this room without saying, you know, I'm spiritually blind, but I want sight. Now, coming forward does not save you. What happens in the pew, what you're praying between your ears, that's what saves you. If you just cry out in this moment, Jesus, I need you. Give me eyes to see, ears to hear the good news of your gospel. Help me to believe that you are the God who loves me, who died for me, who rose again. I repent of my sin. I make you Lord of my life.
If you pray something like that, you'll be saved. But I invite you to come forward so that I may help you. That we as a church family may help you. That we can wrap our arms around you and help you in this journey of what it means to be a Christian. So if you're here today, you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus. Do not leave this room without doing so. If you've never been baptized, I'd be honored to baptize you. That is making a public profession of your faith. I'd love to baptize you and help you walk out your faith journey on earth. If you've never been, uh, if you'd like to join us as a, a member, join our church, lock arms with us, um, I'd love to have that conversation with you. And if you need prayer, of course, the altar is open. You can do some work with the Lord on the stairs, or I would be honored to pray with you. Would you stand as we sing the song? Father God, we thank you so much for this day you've made. We thank you, Lord, for how you're moving in and through this series. And I pray that we, as as um, apprentices of you embody what it means to glorify you in word, in thought, in deed. May we be worshipers of you who give you praise and exalt your name on high for who you are and what you've done for us. May our lives be lives marked by your hope, your joy because of what you've done for us and who you are. Oh God, you are so good and we praise you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Respond as the Lord leads. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart. shout his praise. Let's lift this up high this morning. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. conclude this morning, I just want to make note of a few announcements that you need to be aware of on your way out today. Uh, but I want to point out first and foremost, if you have yet to do so, uh, you'll notice in the past couple of weeks we have started, uh, we have transformed the Exchange Weekly newsletter that we put out into the Weekly Worship Guide. So um, this is something that we have developed kind of just for you to have a resource uh, to take discipleship home 
outside of the four walls of the building, outside of your normal Sunday, Wednesday routine, this is for you to take that with you. Not only does it have our calendar announcements and all the stuff that we had on the weekly, but it has pointed discipleship discussion questions on the inside. Um, that is so that you can, like I said, take that home and allow that to be um, a part, not just of Sunday morning, not just of get gathering for worship with the unified body of believers on Sunday, but take that home to have discussions with your family, have discussions with the people around you about what we have discussed and what we've been shown from God's word here on Sundays. Inside of that, I want to remind you that if you're visiting with us, there's a connect card inside of that. If you'll do us a favor, fill that out and drop it in the offering plate on your way out. Um, also, I know a lot of times and for a very long time, we've utilized that card mainly for uh, connecting with those who might be joining us for the first time. But if you're here and you just simply need prayer, um, and maybe you didn't come forward this morning, maybe you uh, just have been thinking about something for a long time that you need prayer for, we want to encourage you that the back of that Connect card has a prayer space on it. Uh, write, write down your prayer request on it. It can be, uh, you can write your name, it can be private, whatever you need to do. Uh, our staff, during our staff meetings, uh, we pray over those cards. So uh, we want you to know that if you have a prayer that you want to uh, inform our staff of, uh, write that down and it will be prayed for this week by our staff. So we just want to make note of that. On your way out today, you'll have the opportunity to give as well a tithes and offerings. We encourage you to uh, let us remain faithful as a church family to what God has for us, the mission that he has for us here on this corner. And then lastly, as Pastor John mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, our students are having our See You at the Pole rally this week. Uh, we'll be headed over to Redemption Church, just about a mile and a half south of here. Um, we're going to be joining with four other youth ministries um, in the Oklahoma City metro area. Uh, to be a part of that event. It's going to be an awesome, awesome day, awesome, awesome week of ministry in uh, that way for See You at the Pole. So it's going to be um, awesome. Students need to be here uh, Wednesday night by 6 o'clock, preferably closer to 545, but they need to be here by 6. Uh, we're going to hop on the van and head over to Redemption Church. So it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. And then lastly, I know I said lastly already, but I'm going to say it a second time. Uh, lastly, lastly, uh, just a reminder, we have uh, candy that we need for fall festival. Uh, so we are in need of candy donations and all of the above. So next time you're at the grocery store, uh, please, please, please pick up an extra bag of candy. Uh, we'd love to take that up for our fall festival as we have, uh, as if you've been to our fall festival, there's a lot of candy involved. So we want you to be a part of that uh, as well. And then uh, I keep thinking of more as I'm going along. There's women's Bible study beginning on September 30th. Uh, talk to Donna about anything in regards to that. You can check out the women's ministry table out in the hallway as well. We're excited about what God is doing. Let's take what we've learned today, take what we've heard. Let's apply it to our life and love those around us for his glory. I invite you to stand as I close us in a word of prayer this morning. Lord, once again, we come before you grateful for your word, and we thank you that you allow us, because we are created for your glory, you allow us to serve you, and I pray that we would continue to do that as we go this morning. Thank you, O oh Lord, for bringing us here safely today, and we pray that we would be catalysts in our community, families, and in our neighborhoods, and in our circles, Lord, for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon, everyone. is